Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I don't really like to stand in one place, so I tend to move. So I, I think I project loudly, but if I don't, let me know. Probably my biggest problem is I get oh, so excited I might go a little too fast, so I'll try to keep my excitement down, okay? So I'm at the University of North Florida, which is in Jacksonville, and really our, our kind of focus is kind of backyard archeology span for us, which means the Northeast Florida area. So what I wanna talk about tonight is this really kind of these ongoing and past excavations that we have done at, at a place called the Armelino site. So the archeological name of the site is the Armelino site, and it's at Big Talbot Island. So if you have Jekyll, you have Cumberland, you have Amelia Island, then it's going to be Big Talbot Island. So it's maybe the fourth barrier island to the south, all right? We feel really, really confident, it's taken me a long time to say this, that we think this is the Mokama community of Cerebay. It appears in the early French and Spanish documents. So we really think that our excavations now are kind of trying to, are really providing kind of an on the ground window into Mokama life and into the community organization. And to me, what's really important about this is we're looking at this within the first few, three or four decades of European contact and missionization. So when they begin missionization, a lot of archeologists tend to focus on the missions themselves, focus on the kind of the core area, where's the church, where's the priest living, that. We're really moving out into other sites that are near those areas that are indigenous based, okay? When I talk about this site of Cerebe, I'm really focusing probably on the 1580, 1620 region, uh, time period. So think about that. During that time period, you have one Spanish priest living on an adjacent island, one Spanish priest that's gonna be living on Cumberland Island, and maybe 100 to 120 that are living in St. Augustine. So this really still is an indigenous kind of world, okay? So let's see if we got this working. Yeah, so we have a couple of projects that are going on. We're an undergraduate-based program, so we don't have graduate students, but I have these really great, great grad undergrads who we kind of try to train and then they go on to graduate school or go on to kind of a, a career in cultural resource management. So the project that we're working on now is really a kind of a multidisciplinary. I'm working with a historian, Denise Bosi, at the University of North Florida. Uh, we're also uh, looking at a linguist who is studying the Tamuqua language at the University of Florida, Aaron Broadwell. So we're really trying to do archeology, span history, linguistics, remote sensing, lots of different things that are trying to bring this together. And what we wanna do is we wanna to try to uncover all the archeological sites that date from the late 16th century, the late 1500s, into the early 18th century, the early 1700s, okay? So we want to reconstruct the social landscape in Northeastern Florida at the time of European arrival and shortly thereafter. So in addition to really locating those sites and trying to explore kind of their internal layouts, we really also want to start to research the social histories, their practices, the cultures, the polities, everything that's going on among the indigenous people during that time period, 16th, 17th, and 18th century. So we want to see what's going on here really in the face of European contact, colonization, missionization. And the word, the buzzword now is the entanglement that goes on between indigenous people and Europeans during these, these, these immediate centuries that are following it. The other thing we're really trying to do is trying to really take an indigenous perspective, put an indigenous, a Native American perspective on what's going on, this complex entanglement between the two sides. And what this means is we're not trying to erase or make the Europeans and colonization disappear. That's not it at all. What we're trying to do is provide a history in which the indigenous past is on equal footing with these larger histories that are there. And my belief is that if we want to try to understand what happened, we want to understand that colonial encounter from the first moment of contact until they're really forced out of the Northeast Florida area, to really understand that, we have to place that seamlessly within a really long, deep indigenous history of the area. Because what we're going to see, pre-contact circumstances are really going to start to shape the contours of kind of the realities that the indigenous people are going to face you know, during the colonial period. 
So I think our ultimate objective is to try to kind of write and center a deep, deep indigenous history of northeastern Florida that really goes back, you know, 10,000 plus years up until the pretty much the 1700s when we really kind of lose sight of indigenous people in the Jacksonville or northeast Florida area. All right, so I'm going to talk about the Mokama. Uh, the Mokama is a dialect of the Tumuqua language. So Tumuqua is really not an Indian tribe. It's actually a language that's spoken over a broader area. But to kind of, um, kind of contextualize that broadly, broadly, here are the Tumuqua speakers in this area. You got the Appalachian, which would be in the Tallahassee area. You'd have on your shores here, and just to the north are going to be the Wally. Then you have the Muscogee and uh, the Miccosukees and other speakers to the interior area of Alabama and Georgia. So that's kind of the broader social geography of the Southeast at the time I'm going to be talking about. So if we want to kind of zoom in, what we can see here, this is the Tamuco speakers. Probably down towards the Orlando area, over towards the Asilla in the beginning of the Panhandle, then into southeastern Georgia. Tumuqua speakers are living in the Okefenokee Swamp area, and we're moving out probably to about the Satila River in Georgia. So it's really a large area, a lot of different environments that they're going to be living in. They're going to be living in the coastal areas, the, um, the lacustre and the lake areas, the inner riverine areas, the inner lake areas, the swamp areas. So really a diverse, diverse area. Mokama actually translates to the sea, the sea, S-E-A, kind of emphatically. If there's a bar in Fernandina Beach, I don't know if anyone's been there, which is on Amelia Island, it's called Mokama Brewery. They interpret Mokama in this purple prose, the yellow sun that rises out of the blue sparkling waters on a, on a sunny day. But it just means the sea. So they are the Mokama dialect, the maritime dialect. And it differs a little bit from the Agua Salada, which is a saltwater dialect which would have been spoken at the community of Saloy, which would have been one of the big communities in the St. Augustine area. So we have two slightly different coastal dialects. Mokama is going to be going into Cumberland Island, the mainland Georgia coast, probably up until up into the Satilla River. We're starting to get a lot of great information coming out of the University of Florida with Aaron Broadwell, an incredible corpus of writings that are in the Tumuquan language. And what's great about it, it's in Tumuquan and then it's in Spanish. And what he's starting to learn about this is that everyone thought this one priest was this great linguist who's doing everything. It appears now there are indigenous ghostwriters who are doing most of this. Because once you read it in Spanish, everyone assumed that the Tumuquan part said the same thing, and it's not. It's being filtered through a Tumuquan lens. So it's being couched in much different terms in the indigenous language than it is in, in, um, in Spanish. All right, um, so what about the Mokama? What do we kind of know about them? They're Tumuqua. So just because we say Mokama, we're not saying this is a better name. We have no idea what their self-identifying name was. Mokama, Tumuqua, any term we use, we're imposing on them, all right? We tend to use Mokama because it just provides a little more specificity, okay? It's just specific to the Northeast Florida, Southeast Georgia area. If we were in the Gainesville area, we'd be talking about the Potano. Okay, we'd talk about the Ifi and other groups in the Okefenokee area, the Oconee that are in those areas, all right? What we do know about them, a little bit from archaeology, but also from the documents really trying to tease things out that are recurring themes, is we do see that they have leaders. And it's one of our ways of trying to be a little more from the indigenous perspective, use some indigenous terms, holata. Holata is their word that we would use for chiefs. So their leaders are holatas, all right? We see that there are honored councils that were there. So they kind of mitigated the absolute authority of these holatas, all right? So there were these larger councils that do have input in what's going on. We see ranked clans, so they're matrilineal, which means you reckon your descent through your mother's line, okay? It doesn't mean you don't recognize male relatives, but it's all through your mother's line. So it's your mother her siblings, her mother's mother, her siblings, mother's mother, her siblings, and so forth. So that's how you reckon your descent. So I might be a member of the deer clan. I would have to marry someone from another clan. Let's say that I would marry someone from the fish clan. Our child would be a fish, not, not a deer. So really the maternal uncle would be more like the father figure, okay? All right, so it's a little different kind of structure here. 
Women carry incredible power within these systems. That gets lost with, with really patriarchal-oriented European writers. They want to deal with men, so they underestimate, underplay women's role, clan mothers and the like. So these are important things that are kind of going on sometimes we lose sight of. They have towns. We, call, we make a little distinction here. A town is a little bit more formalized community because it has a council house, right? It has a major political center. Other ones are smaller that are tied to it. So what we see in early documents, probably right around the 1600s, maybe 20 or 25 communities from Jacksonville to Cumberland Island, okay? Some of them are small and tied to larger communities. Others are kind of larger communities with their own holadas. So they seem to have a series of holadas, right? The two big leaders, the two big leaders, one at the mouth of the St. John's River, Satariwa, gets a lot of press because the French are there. The other one who ends up becoming, or his community becomes stronger in the 1600s is Takata Karu. And Takata Karu is at the south end of Cumberland Island. Uh, Dungeness Wharf, you know, the NPS uh, National Park that's there. There was a community there, there was a later mission there at San Pedro, all right? They have a mixed economy. They are fishing. They are fisher folks and shellfish collectors. They have been fisher folks and shellfish collectors probably since the shoreline stabilized 4,000 to 5,000 years ago, okay? Corn is added late. I think this is one of the big contributions that we have made is we date a lot of corn. Or we get pottery that has corn imprints on it and we can scrape off soot and date those. What we're showing there, and this is consistent, and Dave Hurst Thomas is getting this with the Wally as well, they're not growing corn on the coast until about 1450. So when Juan Ponce arrives on the shoreline of Florida in 1513, they've probably been growing corn for only decades, maybe a century, all right? So it's a late addition, okay? People always ask, well, why, what took them so long? For me, is why did they even do it? Living on the coast so rich like that? Uh, so I think the reason for it, this is another story, it's gonna be either more political or religious. All right, and then kinship and marriage, they have these great interaction networks. My main research is a thousand years ago, and we got this great connection, this one side I'm working on, to Cahokia. So you got these great long distance interaction networks. Those actually break up about 1300. So the regional interaction networks we see with the Mokama and the Tumuqua are more regional based, but there is a lot of interaction that is going on, all right? So that's what's going on, we see these, um, communities that are tied to each other through marriage, through kinship, alliance. So it's really, really active. We're not seeing things come in here from a great, great distance like we did earlier, but there's a lot going on. So we're trying to track these as well. All right, has anyone ever seen this? Okay, this is what I want you to leave here with. Okay, it's nothing like this. So <laughs> say no to the Debris. So these are Debris engravings. And these are based on so many misconceptions. So our big pro one of our big projects right now is we're trying to reframe these and we're having indigenous artists help us with this. So we think that this is based on hand staden stuff, which is in Brazil. It's based on what was going on in the Virginia colony. So it's nothing like this, okay? So we're trying to really move away from this. These, this is a palisade. Okay, a wall, a stockade around communities. And you see this in some of the Mississippi communities in the interior. There is not one mention in a French account or a Spanish account of any group in Florida having a wall. The only mention of it is in this, in the caption. And this is basically an engraving that's 40 years later, supposedly based on a water coloring that we don't have, okay? So be really cautious of the Debris engravings. All right. so. Let's start looking at Cerebay, okay? What do we know about Cerebay from the documents? From the documents, we have the French arriving. Everyone heard of Jean Ribot? If you're from Jacksonville, we call him Ribault, right? All right, Jean Ribot, he's here in Jacksonville, right? Do you know how long he's in Jacksonville, Florida, at the mouth of the St. John's River? What's that? 1530. No, it's, six, uh, it's, in, it's 1562. But how long do you think he's actually there? Three years? He, Two days, two days, okay? He's there two days, he goes back, establishes Charles Fort on Paris Island, South Carolina, goes back to England, gets arrested, 
Okay, eventually it gets back here. But they have a second colony, the La Caroline, or in Jacksonville, Fort Caroline colony, and that's 15 months. So that's short-lived as well. So in that second colony, René Laudanier, okay, he basically says, hey, there's this community called Serenay, and their fields are ripening. Okay, let's go, let's go steal their corn, right? <laughs> then we got Cerave, which is probably just a, a, another just misspelling of the same word. And here they say, hey, it's on an arm of the river, which is what today would be the intracoastal before it was all dredged out, and it's like one and a half to two leagues from the fort. So that probably put it, you know, in the six, seven mile range, something like that, right? They say, hey, we go there because we've got great clays that we want for bricks, all right? Also, lots of times they have all these kind of diplomatic relationships, the French do, with various, in their word, kings, right? Holatas. And one of the ones that recurring that meets with them is Serenay. So we think all of these are basically kind of bastardizations of the same word, all right? So we hear about this community just in passing. Doesn't tell us really much about it, all right? So the Spanish arrive. Okay, the Spanish arrive, and eventually, people don't realize this, the, the, the French are, are, are trying to get out of here. It's not working out. So they, they go to leave, and then Ribot comes back with reinforcements, but then shortly after, Menendez comes back, and all this stuff, the, French, the Spanish get evicted. So now the Spanish are here. So we had the French here 1562 for two days, then for 15 months in 1564 and 65. Now we have the Spanish. The Spanish will start missionization first with the Jesuits and then eventually with the Franciscans, all right? So this really starts in earnest in our area in 1587. So there's a community called Alamakani. They will erect a cross there. And the way that this is working is indigenous leaders, Holatas, are asking them to come in. And typically they're coming into the bigger communities. So Alamakani becomes San Juan del Puerto, right? Takata Karu in 1587, on Cumberland Island becomes San Pedro de Mocama. Eventually, in the early 1600s, you will get uh, Santa Maria, which is on Amelia Island, and then you'll get an upstart mission of Guadalquini, which is on St. Simons. And I think they have moved Mocama speakers or Tumuco speakers to this area uh, in, in early 1600s. So in the early 1600s, that's what you have. You have those four missions and then a series of other communities outside of it. The one we're going to look at is a community that's outside of Alamakani. So they're going to be right here on the adjacent island. All right. So the one priest is living there, one priest is living there, and then you have that small hundred or so in St. Augustine. All right. What else do we know about Cerebe? This is a great map. Map dates to 1704, 1705. So what has happened is the, Spanish, uh, the English have established Charlestown. They've now started slave raiding the missions. And this area has basically been evacuated, okay? But what we see after this happens in 1702, they bring some more people come back up and they have this upstart community called Pilihariba. So if any of you are familiar with Jacksonville, this would be like the Mayport Naval Air Station. This is the mouth of the St. John's River. This is a Queens Harbor Yacht and Country Club uh, today. This right here says the Isle of San Juan, okay? We have no doubt in our mind, it is unequivocal that San Juan del Puerto is on Fort George Island, okay? Up here, the Isle of Santa Maria. There is no doubt that the Isle of Santa Maria is Amelia Island. What that leaves us with, right here between the two, is the Isle of Cerebe, okay? So this map really is strongly indicating Cerebe appears to be Big Talbot Island. So Cerebe becomes the name of a community, but it also becomes the name of an island. So if we go back to 1609, there's a pilot out of St. Augustine who is basically charting the coastline from St. Augustine to the Chesapeake Bay. When he gets to the mouth of the St. John's River, he describes this exact same thing here in terms of names and places that we see 100 years later on this map. So we see Cerebe as an island north of San Juan in 1609. So I think there's really strong evidence to suggest both cartographic and, and um, indirectly with the French that it's on Big Talbot Island, okay? All right, one other piece of evidence that's really pertinent to the time period that I'm talking, everyone okay? Okay, 
All right, the time period that I'm talking about. So at Alamacani, which is now San Juan del Puerto, 1602, Fray Francisco Pereja is stationed there. He's one who everyone thought was a great linguist. Well, he's there, he's writing to Spain. Things are going great. Things are great here. He says it's bountiful. Once he uh, exposes them to the joys of heaven and pains of hell, they are running for conversion. Things are great, right? And in it, he also says, I'm living here at San Juan, and there are nine communities nearby that I proselytize to. So Spanish, we start to refer to those as visitas, okay? Nearby communities that the priest will visit to proselytize. Well, in it, he gives us a little list. And in his list, he says that, hey, the closest one is Cerebe, quarter of league. So it's probably less than a mile away. That strongly implies if we know that Alamacani is at this archaeological site, Cerebe is most likely here. Veracruz, we think we found here, and San Mateo and San Pablo. We really think archaeologically we can equate those names in that document with these locations and these archaeological sites. All right? Um, there are other ones that we think date to this time period. We just don't want to force a name on them. These here we feel really confident about. All right? What's interesting, this one here, San Mateo, okay, it, um, San Mateo is when the Spanish take over Fort Caroline. They name it Fort San Mateo. So anyone who thinks Fort Caroline is on another river, I, I'm not being a homer, it's on the St. John's River. There's no doubt about it, even though we have not found it. All right? So this is what we think we have archaeologically, that we have Alamacani, we have Cerebe, we have Veracruz, and we have San Mateo. All right? So I, uh, I've been asked, uh, this was probably six, seven years ago, Somebody asked me, hey, so what does a Mokama town look like? When I started to say, well, you know, the documents say this. We've done a little bit of archaeology. And then I realized I really couldn't give them a good answer. So I thought, you know what? We need to go back and find an archaeological site that's going to be a village or a town dating to this time period that we can really do some excavation. And it is we're going to come back to Cerebe. All right, so we start out here in 98. I'm asked this question in like 2017, and 2020, we start back up there again, all right? So now let's turn our attention to the archeology span uh, of that area, all right? So we have done a lot of digging. We've done a lot of digging out there. My, my, my philosophy is if we wanna find place-making features, if we wanna potentially find houses, structures, activity areas. We can't dig little holes. We have to dig lots of them together to make big horizontal areas. And that's what we've done. So right now, we have done 163 one by two meter units, okay? Everyone, probably, we use the metric system in American archeology, span right? Everyone know that? Yep, 1970s, American archeologists said the United States is shifting, so we're gonna go ahead and get ahead of the curve. <laughs> Nobody followed us, uh, but here we are. That's okay. So if I say things like that, so our standard unit is a one meter by two meter, three feet by six feet, okay? And so lots of times we cobble them together and have bigger areas, but we're actually taking them out in small, small kind of integrals, integrals. So what we have here are A and B, which we dug in 98 and 99, and since 20 to 23, we've done the rest of these. So as you're gonna see, we have these really large areas that we've opened up, all right? So here we are, mouth of the St. John's River, um, San Juan del Puerto, or Fort George Island, Little Talbot Island. We know it's not Little Talbot Island because Little Talbot Island is, was pretty much a sand spit, you know, just a giant sandbar during the 1500s, except this little area to the top. Here's Big Talbot, and then there's Tip of Amelia Island. So this is 1998, okay, a much younger version of myself. We're out here, and so we get this grant, and we're interested in finding where is Sarah Bay, okay? We've heard about this. This guy, uh, William Jones, I need to give him credit, in the 1960s, he was interested in tabby ruins and plantations, but he found some, some mission period artifacts and said, hey, this could be the location of one of those places that that priest mentions, and he's right, all right? So this is it. This is state land. So we've been working with the state park. We have a few out parcels of private land. So what we did is dug shovel tests. 
So all of these little dots are these small 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter shovel tests. Every 25 meters, we dug it over this area. So if it's a solid dot, that means we found indigenous artifacts in it. If it's open, there's nothing in it. So we start to see where things are. Different time periods are gonna be represented. So we have 625 shovel tests that we've done. So we analyze what's in there. We can use all our statistics and all our distributional surfer and everything like that to kind of look at, hey, at different periods of time, where are they? So we can look at the pottery types at different periods and kind of get an idea of what's going on. Yes, sir? How deep is it? So uh, these here are probably going about a meter, so three feet. So a lot of times what we'll dig to is either the water table, if it gets there, once we get to that, we really can't get out of that. Other times we hit what's called a hard pan, which is underneath, the, like in the Flatwoods area. Uh, but usually we try to go meter, three feet. All right, so here at student, again, I have great students. I get to be this mouthpiece for all this great work that my students have done over the years. And sometimes I don't think they realize what a great contribution that they truly, truly make to everything. But we're, we're digging our shovel test, we're screening it, we're taking notes. We're bagging everything, we go back to the lab, we do our analysis, and we start looking at distributions. All right, so those are all the individual tests. I'm trying to simplify it here. This little darker color right here, that's debating the distribution of pottery that's dating to the 15, maybe early 1600s, is, is in this area. It's not in every one of those shovel tests, but it's distributed over that area, all right? Now you see these little darker, kind of orange or rust color areas, those are like, areas of shovel tests that were really productive for that time period. So we have these kind of hot spots. That red area, that's the first one we're gonna say, hey, we're gonna start sampling these red areas, right? I mean, these uh, rust color areas. So that's the first one we sampled in 1998. It is now 2023, well, I guess it's 2024, and we're still in that one area. It's so impressive that we just haven't had time to get out of it, all right? So the, everything I talk about is coming from this little red, red area right here, okay? So all those units I talked about uh, are there. And again, these locations are based on our shovel test results, all right? These are two major players. You probably know archeologists are obsessed with pottery, uh, <laughs> but I totally understand pots are not people, right? But these provide us really good chronological markers. We have really good dates now. So we know this pottery, and fortunately it's given a, a Spanish name, but it's an indigenous pottery. This is what the Mokama in our area are making on Cumberland Island down into the Jacksville area, probably about 1450 up until uh, the 1600s. And then we see this shift to what's called San Marcos. In Georgia, you guys call San Marcos Altamaha, okay? But it's the same thing. And we start to see this shift among the Wali Indians, among the Mokama, among the Yamasee, all start to convert to making San Marcos. So it becomes really hard to identify ethnic groups because they're all making the same things. But we're trying to find little nuances that maybe can help us. All right, so remember the shovel test we dug? Do you see that little tarp? That is one of our shovel tests. So when we're digging our shovel test, we dug one and we hit this, this stain a little bit deeper down underneath it. And we thought, what's that? that it looks weird, but you can't really tell with that. So we thought, you know what? We're gonna put a tarp in here. We're gonna write this one down. We're gonna come back and explore this one better. And then we went on. So we came back and we found that and now we're starting to open it up. So here we are, 1998. So we have that one. Now we're enlarging it even more, okay? Uh, like I said, so it looks like it's one big unit. We're actually taking it out in these smaller sections. We're taking it out in you know, five to 10 centimeter levels. Very, very systematic. All right, so this is a plan view map, okay? So it means we're looking down on something. So just to kind of orient you here, let's just say this white right here, that's the ground surface, right? This yellow color, that's probably about that deep, okay? So ground surface, we've dug down. We've gone through an area where they had plowed in the 16, I mean in the 18, 1900s. Um, so we're below that and we're in the yellow, kind of yellow sand and we start to see all these stains and we call them features, all right? Now, some of these stains could just be an old uprooted tree. They could just be a gopher tortoise burrow. They could be a rodent burrow. They could be so many natural things, but they can also be cultural things, right? But the one thing that really stands out is this thing right here. Do you see this? 
And here's the shovel test I was talking about. See how that shovel test just clipped it? I'm going to tell you something. Archaeology is a game of inches. Had that been right here, we would have missed this. And everything I talk about from now on, we would have, we would have missed. I would love to say that I have some sort of spidey sense or something, and I knew it was there. I'm so lucky. But I'll take it. All right? So we clipped that. Can you see it right in here? There's our shovel test. This is a door opening in this area. So it's part of a wall trench. This is a little trench they would have dug this wide and placed the post in that wall trench. Unique kind of uh, architecture. But there it is. But you can see we have all these other kind of features in here. Some of them inside of it were chock full of little pits with corn in it and, and, and the like. So really great stuff that's going on here. Another thing, right here on the inside wall, right here on the inside wall, again, four inches from this, it was a complete pot that had been left, probably abandoned along the inside part of the wall. And the only thing at the, the other side, it had been laying there, and in the 1800s, a plow had hit it. And the whole bottom was intact, and the, all the other pieces were strewn about by the plowing uh, that went on. Uh, we also got Spanish olive jars. So we're getting Spanish artifacts. So now we know, hey, indigenous Mocama pottery with Spanish material, it's got to be after 1562, I mean, about after 1565, uh, probably later. So this is a scabbard tip. So it's a sheath to either a sword or a dagger or something like that. So the sheath tip, it's brass. Um, we had a specialist from South Carolina uh, let us know that it's Spanish, not French. All right, so, and here are some other posts. So what happens, all their architecture is perishable material, okay? They're making things out of wood and thatch, palmetto, right? That stuff decomposes pretty quickly. We get lucky is that the organics can stain the surrounding soil. So while the hard, hard wood itself is gone, it can leave the stain here. Now the problem you have with this, the more it rains, the more time it is, the more that organic coloring is gonna get leach out, get lighter and lighter and lighter. But here we still got them. So can you see that these are the profiles of a post? We've got has a nice one there, the nice one here. Behind this one's a nice little pit. You can see a huge shirred piece of pottery right there. So we had all these great, really good features that were there. So we finished this project in 1998, all right? Uh, so here it is. It ended up being 23 one by twos. We got this structure that's right here. Um, and so I get sidetracked for the next 20 years on other great projects. So I decided to come back here because we wanted to answer that question. What is it like? You know, what is a community really like on the ground? So this was our number one candidate. We came back here. So this is 2020, summer field school. Gets canceled because of the pandemic, right? So the University of North Florida says, okay, we're gonna let you have it in the fall, but you gotta have a smaller group, you gotta only do it a few days a week, mask, all that kind of stuff going on. So we did it uh, here. So we are about 25 yards away, okay? So we open this up here. So in 2020, we're here, all right? So I'm just gonna go through this real quickly so you can see it. So we come back, we excavate these, we map them just like we did before, all those features, we excavate them, then we have to bat fill them. So then we come back the next summer and we add to that. So the next summer we're gonna add a few more, making it a little bit bigger, right? So then we do some things off to the side as well. So that's 2021. Then 2022, we're gonna add a little bit more, okay? And deal with them just like we did before. And then last summer, 2023, we came in now, we've connected to this one here, right? So we have this large, really large area. So remember, each one of these rectangles, that's six feet, okay? So we have opened up a pretty big area, all right? The reason we kept expanding is because we were finding things, okay? So now let's kind of take a look at what we were finding, all right? So this is just a first. Uh, you can see we're working in these areas. That darker area there is kind of midden material, but also plow zone. So we're trying to get just below that black area to get the stuff that's still intact. So we get this yellow background, but then we're looking for any stains there. And that's below the plowing. So that means all, everything we see from that point on we're, are intact, they're in good shape. So that's kind of what we're doing here, all right? And so this is kind of the area, kind of working with it, opening it up uh, and so forth. 
Then we jump ahead, here we are in 2021, some of the expansion that's going on. This right here would have been what we had dug previously, it's been backfilled, all right? So we're just opening up these large areas, trying to look for stains, mapping the stains, and then sampling them, right? And then this is this past year, again, kind of doing the same thing, uh, taking them out in one by twos. Uh, everyone is really organized, each person who's digging a unit, their buckets of dirt soil go to a specific screener. So we're keeping everything really organized. I mean, we're really, we're really systematic, methodical. Don't let any archeologist tell you different. We destroy archeological sites, okay? So in order to really make it worthwhile, we have to be incredibly systematic. Outsiders like to call us anal. I prefer methodical, systematic, okay? <laughs> because we are recording everything, we're mapping everything. Now with digital cameras, everything's so, so much better than, you know, we used to have to do slides and then go wait for them to develop. Now we can take 500 photos and it's not a problem. So everything is now well documented, all right? So same kind of map. This is the large area that we've done. It's called Block C, okay? So what you're looking at from here is 1015. This is, that's 30 meters, okay? So that's 90 feet. So this is a big area. Again, these are all the stains that we see. Again, ground surface, and then maybe that deep, okay? And that's all those kind of stains there. So we map them all in, then we uh, cut them in half so that we can take half out, and then we can see the cross-sectional profile to see what it is, because that helps us interpret you know, what it is. So we have something really cool here showing up. So can you see this little blue dot? Right there, yeah. there's one, another one. Students say I do this for dramatic effect, and I guess I do. But look at it, look at it, this is great. So we have, do you see it? We have this huge structure. So those blue things are actually clearly posts, and I'll show you them in profile. So we have this, it's probably 65, 70 feet in diameter, it's big. It is indigenous, right? Uh, we have a date out of one of them, okay? It's definitely in the late 15, early, probably early 1600s, yeah? We also got this huge pit. So this red thing is this huge pit, three, three feet, a meter, three feet in diameter, a uh, foot deep, uh, three feet deep, I mean, it's huge. And we got this other weird looking uh, feature right here. And I'll show you some things here. It's, about uh, six feet, six feet in diameter, another little trench, and we took it out, it's got four posts that were in it. So we're trying to figure out what that is, okay? But it appears to be inside of this larger kind of building, all right? So these are these posts. Just wanna show you I'm not making it up. Right, oops. And I can show you 19 of these, but you can see the post hole right here. So they have these little slots where they're probably sliding it in and then going upright, and there it is right there. There's another one here, another one here. You can see the little slots to them. Uh, they're huge. Students drawing them in plan, and then we cut them in half and cross-section them. So we, um, these are kind of quick drawings of them. We have little Munsells, you know, which are soil color, color chart. So. And here are just a few more. So you can see these great posts that are in here. These are not any kind of trees. These are not any kind of rodent burrows. These are actually decayed posts, all right? Right here, we got this nice, this is a solid charcoal, so we got this nice little cooking pit or hearth. So we have other features as well, all right? So we're getting an array of things that, that are in here, all right? Here's this huge pit, ooh. So, can you, can you kind of see the pit right here? Yeah. This, oops, side's coming in here. Uh, tree in here is kind of disrupting this. This is Gabby, Gabby, I think Gabby's like 5'9", so she's tall. And she's down in there, they're mapping, they're mapping this wall. Right here on the very top of it, a complete wing, all the bones to a gannet, okay? So gannet's usually more found further offshore. We don't know what it is. This is an interesting possibility, but we know that this is the Creek Indian, so it's a different area, and maybe it's 50 to 100 years later, but they talk about these big feasts that they have, and they stir it with the wing of a bird. So we don't know if that's potentially what was being, you know, being used for. Uh, we're getting, I think we have six now, six shark teeth that are in it from six different species. Uh, lots of pottery in there, lots of animal bone in here, uh, whelk shells. It's really great things. So we think it may be some sort of feasting uh, pit that's there. 
Uh, here's the unusual thing. Can you see it right here? Yeah. So it's like it's kind of like this donut. And so we started to take it out. And once we started taking it out, there's a post there, a post there, a post there, and we're working on that post there. So it's a shallow little trench, and it's got posts in there. So we don't know if this is some sort of internal storage thing, if it's a platform. We're, we're just a little baffled, you know, right now. Uh, but it really shows up really, really well. Didn't have a lot of artifacts in it, but what it did have in it is, is um, uh, Mokama, right? So we have a structure here from 98 and 99. We have a structure here, okay, 25 meters away. And talking to my colleagues and other people, we just don't know what kind of indigenous building could be this large other than a council house. So we know that larger communities had council houses. Only really one has been excavated in Florida. And if you've been to Tallahassee, San Luis, it's a massive, massive one. So it's probably three to four times larger than what we have. But these would have been kind of ritualized and politicized spaces within the communities. This is the focus of community life. This is where social gatherings would have been held. This is where political discussions and diplomacy were held. This is where ritual uh, and ceremonial and religious <coughs> ceremonies would have taken place, uh, the recreational things. So this is it. People are probably tethered to these, right? Uh, we also know that living nearby are elites, possibly holadas. So what we're wondering, could we have the council house could this be a holatas or elite persons or some sort of specialized structure? Because wall trench structures are really unique for our area. All right. What's interesting, the shovel test that we did through here, we really didn't find much at all. Stuff all around it. So we're wondering, hey, could we actually be in the center of the community with either a specialized structure or an elite structure, the council house, and then maybe the open cleared plaza area? So that's kind of what we're hoping and working with. All right? All right, everyone okay? I got about 15 more minutes, 10 more minutes with the uh, artifacts. What did we find? All right. Um, one thing I tell you right now is we're gonna take some time off from this site, but when we come back here, we're not coming back to this area because right now we're myopic. We get, we're just focused on this one area. So all this great stuff we're finding, is it indicative of the broader community or is this just stuff that's kind of relating to it being the center of the community? So a lot of those questions we really can't answer. So we start moving out and trying to look at everyday context where people are living every day and working every day. Uh, so the main pottery is San Pedro. This is what the Mokama are making. Uh, it tends to be a roughened surface. So after they make the pot and it's still a little damp, they usually roughen it with something. Some instance, it's a kernelless corn cob that they're doing. Other times it's woven material, uh, could be cordage, but they're usually giving it this roughened kind of look. And it's really not the most aesthetically attractive pottery that we have in our area. They do this thing called obliterating where they'll, they'll have a design, then they'll just kind of wipe it across. And what's interesting, we only see this among another group of Tamuqua speakers in the Gainesville area, Potano and their lateral pottery. Really, really similar, okay? Then we have San Marcos. We think we have a in situ, an in place transition from them making one type to making the other type. We have dates on soot from both of these that are identical, statistically identical dates. So this is your, Irene, this is your um, San Marcos, you guys would call it, um, uh, Altamaha, it tends to have, uh, Irene has the fill foot cross with a curve. By, by the 1600s, they dropped the curved element out and it's just a, the square, so you can see it. And there's that central dot. You can see we have central dot there, the central dot there. Uh, this is another spiral design. These are incised and punctated designs. Much more ornate in, in its decorative modes. Again, just a few more of the uh, San Marcos will get the, uh, the, uh, the hollow tool. Some people will think it's cane or river cane or reed, uh, or it could be bird bone, something hollow uh, to make those really nice designs. Punctated, lunar shaped, uh, could be like fingernails or something along those lines. Uh, this is a lot of times it's just over stamped, so you can't really tell what's going on, just a lot of little individual knobbies from them just going in different directions with the paddle. Okay, we're getting colonial wares. 
Okay, so kilona wares are made by indigenous women, okay, indigenous potters, but they're being made in European vessel forms. So, they're, so what we're seeing here is that these are handles. So these would handle so probably to like pitchers or mugs. We'll also get foot rings. We'll also get these brim, they're called marlies, but these inverted kind of brims around, around kind of deep dishes or plates that they have. So they're being made by indigenous women. Everyone used to think these, when you find these, they're found in St. Augustine or they're found in mission sites. And at the mission sites, they're being made for the priest who wants some of the luxuries, you know, uh, of what they're used to. Uh, when we find out that we have a large number of them here and that a completely indigenous community has given us other insights. Uh, these are not colonial wares. These are just a couple of uh, tobacco pipes that are indigenous made. This one's great. I wish we had more of this one. So this one, we have the front part of one and you can see a little spur in the front of the bowl. This is the back part of the bowl. So this is where the, uh, uh, the pipe stem would have come in, probably some sort of reed. But what's interesting, this right here, this is a, it would have been a human face, and that's an ear. So that's an ear, and that's an ear, ear ornament. Kids today would call them gauges, you know, it would have been an ear. Native, not Spanish. No, these are, these are, yep, these are native. Um, so, uh, yep. Uh, we're also getting other types. They're continuing to make their typical traditional types of things. We're getting lots and lots of busican welts. We're getting beads. We're getting modified uh, quaha clam using uh, spoke shaves or other types of things. Arts with holes in them, whether they drill them or they, they find them already like that, uh, that they, they utilize. We're getting really large numbers of these. Just showing a few here. Lots of varieties of our welt shells. You know, we're in Northeast Florida. Like you guys, we have no stone locally here. So all our stone is deeply buried, so they can't get to it. So if they're going to want to get any kind of stone, they're going to have to go to the Gainesville area. It's the closest area. Uh, heavier pounding stuff really is the Appalachian Mountains. So believe it or not, they're using these. Even to like to uh, probably girdle trees and then fell them, but to make a dugout canoe, they're actually using these kind of mounted. And think how tough that is. What they did is they would burn it, the top of it. Then they're going to take that and now their dugout canoe is this deep. Then they burn it again, and now their dugout canoe is this deep. So it's just a laborious kind of process. This is the cayumela, the center spine here. And these are two kind of little ear pendants uh, that we got. Uh, we're getting Spanish artifacts. So right now, we're probably close to 120, 125 olive jar. So olive jar, these big amphora-shaped vessels that are coming from Spain, right? So initially they have probably like uh, olive oil in them, but grain, water, they become really popular and we see them being traded to or, or indigenous people were getting them. So we see them sometimes where a lot of the green has, has, has come off, but these are kiln fired, uh, wheel made, uh, and then sometimes we get with the green on it. We have three pieces of Mexican red painted. So this is coming from Mexico via, via the Spanish. Uh, that's here. Um, more olive jar, we've actually gotten Mahalika which is actually the more the tableware. So people are really surprised we're finding this away from it. So we got Columbia uh, white, we got San Luis blue on white. So we got a nice collection of those. We're getting a little bit of glass and we're getting corn, charred corn. So we're getting a nice collection of things that are not just uh, indigenous. Um, and don't think that we start to see indigenous, we start to see European goods, that that means they're losing their indigenous identity. Uh, a lot of times they're selectively adopting these things and then they're basically using, utilizing them whether, whether they modify them or not through an existing kind of cultural framework, right? And these things have, are, are used in traditional ways that themselves were always open to change and revision, all right? Then we have some more religious related things. So this is a monstrance pin, okay, or a monstrance symbol. We've had Catholic scholars kind of verify this. So this is probably made out of a local shell so this is the centerpiece. You can see one of the arms to the cross. Probably the hole it went through is broken right there. Uh, these are the actual growth, you know, the ribs to a shell. It's probably like a, uh, uh, a cockle or something like that. But this would have been, you know, a monstrance symbol, which is part of the Eucharistic adoration. So it's supposed to recognize the uh, consecrated host and the power of God within it. So we see this really strong type of thing. We found our first medal. All right, so this is St. Teresa de Villa. Uh, what is great for us 
you can see, you can see her habit, you can see the halo, uh, see a little cross right there, and in the backside she's holding presumably the uh, baby Jesus. Uh, she's not um, canonized until 1620, so we, they think this is the first batch kind of a medals for her going out. So this lets us know this site's lingering into the 16, 1620s. It's a great find. What's interesting, it's like this big. It is tiny. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's tiny. Then we got this piece here. So this is a piece of pottery. And they're, you see a little circle and they got these little wedge shaped things. So they're practicing on something. This, this is the backside, if it's a little wet, can you see what they're drawing on the backside? I'm using Photoshop here, but I'm not taking any liberties. Because you can see them, if you start to look, they're there. And that's what we see right here. So they're actually kind of you know, using this to make crosses. Again, I think we need to really be careful about what this means to them, okay? Indigenous people are well known for really kind of becoming, really wanting to learn more about other people or different spiritual beliefs and then they'll take aspects of those and try to align them with what they have. So they're not scuttling their own religion, they're usually adding things that fit within their own kind of framework. We think indigenous people are probably engaging Catholicism in different ways and to different degrees. What it means to a priest, he sprinkles water on them, they're baptized, they're converted. A lot of times indigenous people may not really know what's actually going on. So I think it's something we need to kind of keep that in mind when we think about, think about these types of things. I always get asked, find gold. We finally found gold. Uh, so this is a uh, glass bead, but it's gold gilded. Uh, so this is a nice little find uh, right here. So what can we say here at the very end? I, I do, and I've kind of hemmed and hawed about this for a long time, being really conservative about, is this Cerebe? Well, one thing I tell you, it is a Mokama community. But based on everything we know, I don't see any other choice for it to be anywhere else but Cerebe. So I feel really strong that, that this is Cerebe. Um, it's a broadly dispersed community. What we know from those four other sites that I showed you is that their, their communities are linear. They're probably distributed along, you know, along the marshes. So they probably have a central cleared out hub area with the council house, with their single ball field pole and with maybe elite residents here, then others just kind of spread out over a much larger area. They're tethered to this. This is the focal point of the community, right? So that's what we think it's like. It's nothing like this. Uh, we do see European materials, but again, we don't need to say, oh, the more they have, the more European they are. That doesn't, it's not what it means. But we're seeing a nice collection of things. We have at least two structures so far, a really big one, which we're really thinking and hoping is the council house, and then that smaller one, which is some sort of a unique construction that might be a specialized uh, structure, or it's going to be an elite uh, whole lot of residents. And I think we probably have this being occupied probably from 1450, 1500 until the early 1600s, but where we are, based on our radiocarbon dates, based on what we're finding, is that this hub area that we're really focusing on, 1580s, 1620s range. Okay, and so we have these gates here with, so if we want to say 95% confidence, we're, we're looking at that range, but I think we can say it a little bit later. Yes? Did you find any skeletons, and what could you say about the seeds? Okay, I'm going to end right here first, and then we'll go there. So I just want to end real quick. I have so many people to thank. Uh, state park system has been great. Okay, they really have, they've helped us. They've been really, really big supporters of what we're doing. Uh, they've allowed us to get grants. Uh, and get uh, permits and things like that. Uh, Talbot Island State Park has really provided us with some funding. Uh, Tamukum Parks Foundation has been really incredible, letting us utilize some of their areas out there. Same with North Florida Land Trust, the Borgman family, and then students. Students are truly fantastic. So what it is, we have a summer field school. We always work on the site. And then in the fall, I get to teach a, a laboratory class and we work on analyzing them. So we're trying to wrap up the 2023 year now. So we did a lot of it in the fall and we're working on it now. All right, so that's it, but I'm gonna to get to your question. We have not found any human remains. We do not want to find any human remains. That really triggers a lot of other things, so we haven't, we haven't found any. Um, well, the other question was disease. Disease is happening. I think disease is a little overplayed because what we do see, 
okay, first of all, this is ground zero for early French and Spanish. This lower Georgia coast, northeast Florida, it is ground zero, right, for that there. I mean, they are going to bear the brunt of it. And we do see in the documents, they say that the Pacis, which are these little outbreaks of disease, are hitting, they're, so they're hitting pockets of areas. We also know that people are leaving these communities. One thing you see in the documents over and over again that doesn't get a lot of public play is they're leaving here for the woods. They're leaving, they're going into the woods. They're visiting people in the woods. Something is going on in the woods. I want to know, but they're going into the woods. Sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't. So I think there's people moving out. So we always have these terminal narratives. Well, there aren't any Tamuqua today, so the Tamuqua are gone, they're extinct. There are um, the, the Muscogee Creeks in Oklahoma, as well as the Seminoles claim Mocom or Tamuqua ancestry. So it's like those people going into the woods eventually move in with those groups as well. And we see this in the Appalachian region who will eventually become the Muscogee in Oklahoma. How do you, when you go to a site, where do you, how do you determine where you're gonna sink your first shovel? Arbitrary. A lot of times you just say, okay, we're just gonna start here. You know, so if maybe something's happened and we know something about area, a lot of times we're just gonna say, oh, we're gonna start here. And I'm gonna say, this is 1,000 north, 1,000 east. And we start here, and then we build a grid from that. Now, sometimes, well, this other site that I'm working on, that's really my favorite site, is dates to 1,000 years ago. There was this large mound of shell in the middle, so we decided to start there. And yeah, it's like the best place I've ever excavated. Yes? The, uh, the, the pipes that you found, was this tobacco grown locally, or were they trade with other Indians? Uh, I, think, I think there are. The problem with tobacco is notoriously hard to find archaeologically because it's so small, but residues can sometimes be found in the, in the, there. So we think they are growing small amounts of it here. Uh, did you find any uh, lithic artifacts? A few. So we have, um, we have a couple of really older points that are probably archaic, so they're like 5,000 years old that they have probably found and have reutilized and small little, we call them Pinellas points, which are your true little arrowheads. They're really crudely made, but five, in five in or six of them, not a lot. Small, very small amounts, yeah. We know from the documents, they supposedly are tipping their arrows with uh, the teeth. Okay. In the documents, the documents say that they're tipping their arrows, and putting it in the edge of arrows, arrowheads, are, are, are teeth, various animal teeth. Mm -hmm. So they're probably using a lot, utilizing localized things or, or fire-hardened wood. So they were farming more than, than funding, do you think? Mm -mm. I think farming is coming into play and they're farming, but it's on the side, it's, it's supplement here. Farming increases when the f Spanish arrive. They put a lot of pressure on them to grow more. So I think they're, I, but I think they're fisher folks. The fish is what, fish is it, man. Fish is a staff life. I mean, if you're living on the marsh, what do you, I mean, fish. I mean, they're definitely they're they're eating they're eating deer. In certain contexts, we find more deer, opossum. They have all that garbage that's out of there, yeah. that like shell midden stuff. I guarantee you they're setting up traps to catch opossums and raccoons that are coming at night, you know, to feed off that stuff. So they're eating mammals, sure, and they're hunting, but fish is incredible. And I think uh, farming starts 1450, small scale gardening, more intensive after European arrival through the mission system. No, these are all gonna be Spanish and French documents, so we have to be careful because they're being filtered through Spanish and French eyes. So no, they have no writing system. But then you talk about uh, a, a Spanish document and a French. Yeah, so what happens is, so when we move into the late 15, early 1600s, they must be teaching certain indigenous people how to write, and so they're writing it in, in kind of in Tumuqua. So they're helping with that. But they themselves never did any writing in that way. Um, and so they're probably, uh, uh, a couple of, uh, in the Spanish doctors, they talk about really early on wanting to take some of the elite's children to Cuba or somewhere to teach them how to read and write, things along those lines. We don't know the specifics of it. On the uh, ceremonial lodge house or the... Council house? Council house. Public building? I 
Sometimes the, the, what we haven't seen, are there like interior support posts for the rafters to go on? We don't see that. The problem we're having, some of the areas we're having is that plowing is probably messing some of it up. The other thing we should have, and we got a little bit of this, is in the center part of it, the big thing they say is there's this large central fire and that has been born, burning immemorial. We did get a little bit of area of burning, a little it's superficial, but at the one in Tallahassee, they didn't find a lot of burning, it was real thin. Um, but we should have, you would think we'd have more support posts inside. So that's some of the things we may want to open up more to look for those. One other question about mm -hmm. that you mentioned, the Yamasee mm -hmm. is that, is that Mm -hmm. Okay. And the conjecture was that they were forced out of Florida by the Spanish. Is that inaccurate? Now, so the Yamasee probably origins are probably in the Coney River, central Georgia. They moved to the coast, then they moved down into Florida, then they get tired of Florida, they go up to south, uh, being pushed. They're following the politics that's kind of going on. So they um, end up being raided, then they go to South Carolina, and then they help out raiding coming back. So the embassy have a long kind of uh, interesting uh, history. Uh, Denise Bosi is having a book, a book coming out on that. So we have Yamasee sites on Amelia Island, on uh, St. Simon's Island, uh, on uh, Cumberland Island, and eventually they move into St. Augustine, but eventually they move up to South Carolina and, and affiliate with the English. Coiled, yes, yeah, coiled. A lot of times we get nice little coil breaks and stuff like that. No, no, no kilns. Okay, so this is an open pit firing, um, uh, and um, no wheel or anything like that. Impressive stuff for 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 making it in those those ways. Anything else? So um, yeah, if you ever just want to check out what we're doing, I don't do social media. I started a Facebook page a long time ago. I guess that's no longer the the thing for kids, but I put it on there for kids to see. Um, for the parents and stuff like that. So we go to UNF Archaeology Lab and you can see what we've been up to. We're working on another site. If you ever want me to come back to talk about a thousand years ago, it's great. We had connections to Cokie and South in uh, St. Louis area. So we got great stuff there as well. So uh, lots of great archaeology. If you're ever interested in seeing archaeology in action, we uh, will be on National Park Service land at another site this summer. Uh, so just let me know. All right. Yes.